And uh, we're really pleased to have uh, Dr. Hatija Savas um, here to talk about updates in pet and prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Savas is an assistant professor of radiology here at Northwestern. And she has functional imaging, like pet imaging. This topic is very timely, particularly the uh, um, recent uh, FDA approval of the UIL PSMA compound. Um, but obviously, uh, hopefully, she'll cover uh, uh, other pet radio tracers as well. Thanks again, Dr. Savas. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ross, for inviting me again. Uh, hello, everybody. As Dr. Ross uh, stated, I am one of the radiologists, uh, and PET imaging is one of my interests. And today I will try to talk about and uh, kind of uh, recent changes, but I will try to uh, touch base with the um, uh, other uh, prostate imaging agents as well. So learning objectives will be to describe the current PET radio tracer to use for prostate cancer imaging. And mostly I will try to discuss with the PSMA imaging. And also, um, if there is a time, I would like to do some brainstorm on future changes, especially here at Northwestern. This slide was uh, a slide I used it a few years ago for another talk. Uh, this was my first slide on that talk too. And I was, uh, you know, uh, trying to give the um, kind of idea about how a prostate cancer uh, evolution. So it was kind of well known that time 80% of the patients will be found to have clinically localized disease at the time of initial presentation after the PSA screening. And then there will be biochemical recurrence in 10 years. Then there, half of the biochemical recurrent patient will uh, progress to overt metastasis. However, when I look at right now, especially uh, the changes in the last, uh, this year, so I think these first two um, sentences will change immediately in a couple of months maybe. And, um, but the last sentence uh, will remain present because the, we are toward to more, more uh, highly individualized molecular imaging technologies, and it is really dramatically improving the ways that we are treating prostate cancer right now. So what were we doing for prostate cancer? It was conventional imaging, right? You were, got, uh, you were ordering all CT cap for the patient and uh, classic bone scan. This was specific for prostate cancer patients, but the altogether sensitivity of the bone scan plus CT cap was almost like maximum 80%. So still 20% of the time, you had no idea what to do with the patients. And that's why recommendations are based on the staging. And they said this combination of CT plus bone scan should be restricted to selected patients population. Those patient populations were high risk and in, uh, intermediate risk prostate cancer patient. Then recently, maybe last 10 years, there is a significant increase in usage of multiparametric MRI. So it is really great for T staging to evaluate the gland and it may guide for um, uh, biopsy or it is, uh, you know, by itself, it is very valuable. But the problem with um, uh, MRI uh, of the prostate in the pelvic nodes, evaluation is pretty limited. And also, if you want to evaluate the bone, it's a limited um, area of concern. That's why they, some institutions are uh, uh, using the whole body MRI just to give more promises to, to detect uh, um, bone uh, involvement. However, it is kind of time uh, either, uh, it is time consuming and it's not really easy to do it. Uh, but in one of the study they uh, did in uh, 96 patients, they found like um, MRI, whole body MRI, uh, especially was uh, helpful in the metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. And uh, they found found new foci almost 50% of the patients. So we all know these facts. When there, uh, there is increased PSA, there is high risk, uh, high uh, possibility of detection of osseous lesion, high possibility of detection of lymph node metastasis. This is our main goal uh, to uh, when we are evaluating the prostate cancer. However, in meta-analysis studies, we did see uh, PSA increase um, 
is not always uh, giving us the, um, you know, the correct way to evaluate the bone scan. So uh, during my residency training, I've been told always like, oh, PSA is less than 10, then this bone scan is not going to show us anything. Uh, because based on the statistical analysis, um, if PSA is less than uh, 10, only 2.3% of the men had positive bone scan. Uh, when there is increased PSA, the likelihood of positive bone scan was also increased too. Similarly, if you have more PSA, higher PSA, the, the likelihood of seeing abnormality on the CT was higher. Actually, this is still the same for PET imaging too. When you have higher PSA level, the likelihood of detecting lesions, number of the lesions uh, are uh, more. We'll, uh, I'll show you in a minute. So. Because treatment uh, is changing and individualized based on the number of the metastatic deposits and location of the metastatic deposits, this is uh, the evaluating and finding them uh, accurately will uh, impact the survival. So obviously outcomes are also progressively worse when you have more numbers of nodal and more distant metastasis this is kind of giving us the surrogate for the tumor burden because we know conventional imaging plus you know mri is not really helping us too much that's uh, was uh, there was always a need for new radiate tracer and specifically focusing on primary detection staging and recurrence of prostate cancer so in the novel radio tracers we have we used to have two groups of uh, radio tracers one was targeting fatty acid synthesis and the most common most famous one is C11 colon in this category the other one is other um, our other uh, famous radio tracer which is working on amino acid transport uh, F18 fully cyclovin or oximin scan However, recently we have a new approval of PSMA agent. There were, uh, you know, uh, the European people were using it for a long time. And also there were uh, research uh, going on in the United, United States for a long time. But somehow approval was not really early. You know, that we were kind of a little bit surprised when they give approval to Oximin, but not PSMA a few years ago. But luckily now we have an approval, so we, uh, it is available for everyone's use. Before starting uh, these famous radio tracers, uh, I just want to talk about uh, with sodium fluoride imaging with one slide, because it is also uh, a PET radio tracer. It, it is uh, used for uh, bone imaging, bone metastasis evaluation, because it is um, mechanism of action is very similar to bone scan. Uh, it is very useful for uh, prostate cancer uh, bone uh, involvement. Uh, the uptake mechanism is stable, uh, uh, similar, but it has better pharmacokinetics, faster clearance, and higher resolution. This is one of the image of the same patient Clearly, the PET imaging has a better resolution, shows more foci of abnormal activity. This has a renal transplant patient, but uh, we don't use it. Why? Because it is not covered by CMS. Although it is FDA approved, since it is not paid, that's why most of the institutions are not using it. Some institutions uh, are using it and mostly covered on their, their research contract, but in general here in Northwestern, we can't use it because there is no reimbursement. And I just want to touch this new uh, guidelines um, uh, for NCCN because it is going to help us to understand the importance of new, uh, the PSMA approval and how it will change our practice. So as you know, you know much, much better than me. So we had bone imaging, we had uh, soft tissue imaging, mostly CT cap or sometimes MRI. These were the two imaging agent, uh, imaging modalities you were ordering for prostate cancer. Then if there was any equivocal bone scan lesion, as you know, bone scan is pretty specific, but not sensitive. You can see lots of false positivity if patient has a prior fracture, although fracture is 
uh, old, you may still see some activity. All that other false positives like fibrous dysplasia, uh, Paget disease or prior trauma related changes, you may see it. So if there was an equivocal uh, result, then we were kind of uh, thinking to do additional imaging, plain films, MR, correlation with other, you know, sodium fluoride and C11 choline, etc. But now uh, uh, they say in the new, new guidelines, alternatively to bone scan plus uh, CT cap imaging, gallium 60A, uh, 68 PSMA or a 18 labeled PSMA, which is pylorify we are using here, uh, either PET CT or PET MR can be considered for uh, bone scan and soft tissue. So this is a big change, and I think this will also affect uh, the uh, current pra uh, the current practice in the entire United States because in Europe usually they already uh, implemented this. In other uh, uh, the countries in Asia they already use this and. Uh, Finally, we have the approval, and I think our guidelines are quickly uh, adjusting it. I just want to touch a little bit with FTG PET. Why? Because uh, FTG PET is our famous radio tracer. We use it almost like 90% of the time in our clinics. It is perfect for most of the uh, cancer uh, staging or primary evaluation because it is very sensitive in uh, high glycolysis. However, in prostate cancer, because the nature is more slow growing and low glycolytic activity, especially in castrate sensitive state, it is not really helpful. Why it is not helpful? Because um, both benign uh, prostate uh, lesions and um, malignant prostate lesions will have the same type of increased uptake or they will uh, no abnormal uptake at all. There might be a really high grade uh, tumor over there. So it's not really accurate. It is not sensitive. It is not specific. Uh, it can be used still. There is a open door to use FTG, especially when there is a de-differentiated aggressive metastasized prostate cancer. We all know the envision trial, almost 10% of the patients were not um, PSMA uh, positive so that we have that 10 percent target population and we have to decide what type of imaging modality we will use on this uh, patient population and also there are some uh, uh, cellular level changes in uh, some particular um, uh, the type of prostate cancer, so FDG is uh, maybe helpful on those type of cancers. But the problem uh, when they were trying to use FTG years ago on prostate cancer, they did the imaging did not add anything to the traditional bone scan or cap. That's why they said they did not add much, so we don't need to use it. <clears throat> uh, as a take home point, we really don't want to use FTG PET in most of the cases. However, there is a small group of patients, FTG PET will be very helpful. And just a small note, if you have any incidental focal activity, hotspot in the gland on FTG study, any type of FTG study, maybe you are doing for lung cancer or esophageal cancer staging, if, that, if there is a focal uh, uptake, that has to further evaluate it because, you know, Cancer can be uh, really hot, prostatitis can be really hot, sometimes BPH can be really hot, but to differentiate from each other, we, re uh, we um, recommend further assessment. For further assessment, there is no consensus. Some people are doing, you know, further imaging with MRI or some people uh, do only um, PSA uh, correlation. So let's talk about the C11 colon. This is uh, approved almost 10 years ago. And it is a kind of similar type of me metabolism, but the, it's uh, working on enzymes. The enzymes, colon uh, kinase, uh, are upregulated in the prostate cancer. So based on this, they were focusing on if there is an inc uh, increased expression of the colon transporter, if we attach them uh, with, uh, you know, the radio tracer, then we will see uh, the um, prostate, uh, the cancer deposits. Um, 
it was recommended in biochemical recurrence. This is very important because the insurance coverage is also very related to um, recommendation. So C11 call in recommendation was biochemical recurrence similar to oxymen recommendation. When you had a non-informative conventional imaging uh, on bone scan or CT or MRI, they were using it. Its sensitivity is kind of, you know, okay, 70%, but the most beneficial part of C11 was the specificity. In this study, for example, when you do see this as small lymph node, if you are reading the CT scan of this patient, you are not going to call this abnormal because of the size criteria. And when you do see activity in this nodule uh, in the lymph node with C11 colon, this was uh, almost 90% metastasis. So uh, th this was very important because uh, that time when C11 introduced, the MR was also, you know, like a rising star. They compared it. It's a kind of small study, but they said in one of the study, they said it has 100% uh, sensitivity. You know, we do see every lesion in the gland, and they said may provide more accurate information in the localization of the main tumors. So I'm talking about T staging process itself. So it, uh, they said it is uh, very, very useful. However, another then they, they started doing more studies, and another study suggested uh, sensitivity is just six to six percent. It is not really that much great as previous uh, studies suggested, and. Uh, because of that, we have to be careful about calling PET-CT. It is not recommended as a first-line screening procedure, especially for, to evaluate the T-staging in the prostate gland. It is not recommended. However, there is a kind of consensus. It might be used if uh, there is a clinically suspected prostate cancer when there is repeated negative biopsies. However, in terms of staging, uh, to evaluate the lymph nodes and staging or M staging, the bone assessment, it was pretty specific. It is almost 98, 96% specificity in multiple studies. And this is also important because the RF18 was the most sensitive um, and specific radio tracer for bone uh, assessment. So colon uh, sensitivity and specificity was pretty similar to the F1819. In terms of biochemical recurrence, it was also very useful. So this type of graph you will see in every type of imaging. PET imaging, conventional imaging, doesn't matter. When you have increased PSA, you have better detection of the prostate cancer. The most important thing, what is your PSA level? What is the uh, uh, like a smallest number you can detect? Right now, we are, uh, the, the researchers are uh, focusing on that. So if this is very beneficial, why we don't use it? Because C11 is a cyclotron produced radio tracer. Half-life is 20 minutes. You need on-site cyclotron. It is not uh, really kind of purchasable from a nearby cyclotron because of the half-life. That's why we cannot use. That's why most of the institutions uh, are not using it. Uh, like a Mayo Clinic, the uh, the institution, they have their own psychotron. Uh, they are pretty happy. Uh, actually, uh, because they are using C11 exclusively, uh, they were using C11 exclusively, they had only very few oximin studies there in my Mayo Clinic. Let's talk about oximin. Ox we were so excited when oximin was first approved. It was May 2016, and um, we were expecting actually PSMA will be about to approve too, but it took like five years after this. And it, it, said, it is said it will be covered for its label indication. And label indication was biochemical recurrence. Although in our practice here, Northwestern, not uh, it, it is not used for biochemical recurrence all the time. Uh, we have uh, clinicians, they are using it for primary assessment too. Why? Because they are looking for um, a radio tracer to help the questions which uh, they, can, uh, they cannot get from the traditional imaging. So because it is F18 labeled, uh, it is cyclotron produced. We don't have on-site cyclotron. However, because it has a two hours half-life, it was com commercially uh, purchasable. 
So uh, the company was providing us the unit dose, so we were able to use it for our patients. Uh, just to give some information, when it was first uh, um, in the market, uh, it was about 3600 Currently, it's almost $5,000 per unit dose. It's just a dose, not including the scan or other, um, other expenses. So this is how it looks like. The good thing about the Oxman study, we don't have the uh, activity within the bladder. It is very helpful. Why? Because we do see it now, PSMA imaging, when there is a lot of um, radio tracer within the bladder, it, it, it is really affecting the seminal vesicle evaluation. And also if the prostate is small or if there is a prior surgery biochemical recurrence, sometimes it, it obscures it. So we have to be very careful with the new tracer. However, in Oximan, there is no or very little uh, bladder, urinary bladder uptake. As you see here, distribution is very different than our um, PSMA tracer, and it's very different than FTG. Um, but we have this abnormal uh, foci of activity, and there is a activity within the uh, prostate gland, and it was a positive scan. So indication, uh, as I said, was biochemical recurrence. But when you read the label of the oxymen, it says if it is negative, doesn't rule out the current, uh, recurrent prostate. If it is positive, doesn't confirm it. And, you know, it, uh, the performance seemed to be affected by PSA level, although there is no recommended cutoff to use oxymen study uh, for biochemical recurrence. And the... <sighs> During my practice, one of my biggest thing is the reading oxymen. If it was really straightforward, it was easy to read. But half of the cases, we were all kind of wishy-washy. And if we show the cases each other, half of them were saying, ah, oh, this is positive. The other half was saying this is negative. Um, and one important thing about uh, fluciclovin, if it is used for primary gland evaluation for T staging, the um, BPH and cancer will have similar type of activities. For example, in this case, there is an increased focal activity in the prostate gland and biopsy proven cancer. It was biopsy proven cancer. This one is also very hot and the FDG, uh, the SUV values were uh, almost seven, very similar to each other and this turned out to be BPH. So oxymen was not used and should not be used for primary gland evaluation. Um, there was no absolute threshold. We talk about it and uh, the, the it is again approved for biochemical recurrence. Um, the main limitation with this radio tracer is the limited sensitivity. Uh, it is about like 41% maximum in various studies. If patient has uh, less than one nanogram, uh, uh, less than one PSA. So like other uh, studies, you know, whenever uh, it became available commercially, they correlated with the previous most used um, radio tracer, which was C11 colon. And when you look at here, the, the, uh, the light gray is um, oximen, so it was better, uh, showing better performance uh, compared to C11 colon in uh, multiple different um, uh, low PSA levels. Uh, so they said it is better than um, colon, C11 colon. This is another example from the company provided us. So there is a small lymph node, uh, uh, you know, that it is a uh, radio tracer avid and it is um, positive. But in the real life, again, it doesn't work this way. This is the interpretation criteria. I'm not sure if you are familiar with. There's a lot of things. If it is small than one CM, it's different. It's more than one CM in the focus. You have to compare it to the blood pool and the bone marrow. Um, if you see it on the MIP images, it is high likelihood, low likelihood. It's a little bit confusing. Uh, eventually, you'll get more experience, but one of the biggest challenge when you are doing this uh, interpretation for me was the small sclerotic lesions. Why? Because small sclerotic lesions are known that they are, they may not be um, PSMA, uh, sorry, uh, they may not be oximin uh, avid. 
so uh, we had you know multiple cases patient has a uh, bone scan there are some suspicious uh, um, rib uptake and then they do oximin there are sclerotic foci highly suspicious for metastasis but oximin is negative then you start questioning it is it really negative negative or is it negative because of dense sclerosis and it is difficult to get biopsy from rib lesions so there was always like an email back and forth is it real or not real and if if it was feasible we uh, were ending up doing biopsies um, depending on the uh, patient's um, PSA level. Um, you know, for the fluciclovin, I think there is still a, a open door uh, to use it, especially when the PSMA is negative on the cancers. But again, um, uh, you know, it, it, it it is sometimes very difficult to read this study. One other benef benefit, okay, I don't want to say negative things on one tracer a lot. One thing, it's actually very helpful for our workflow because all of other radio tracers, you inject it and let the patient uh, to stay maybe one hour or 90 minutes for uptake. This radio tracer, we inject it on the scanner and we start uh, the um, imaging it in four minutes. So it is really easy for us to, to do it in our uh, clinics but again so if it is wishy-washy we weren't we had um, we were not sure how to interpret it so let's talk about the PSMA uh, there's a lot of excitement uh, in the United States because it is approved now the whole idea was the PSMA prostate specific membrane antigens are highly overexpressed in prostate cancer cells. This is kind of illustration. Normal cell, we have PSMA, but usually within the cell for uh, prostate cancers, the PSMAs are in the surface of the, uh, the cell. So when you have a compound to to um, go and attach to that uh, the antigens, then you will able to show uh, wherever this antigen is. One other thing, if you want to do the therapy, again, you can uh, target the same antigens for treatment too. So you can label uh, the PSMA with gallium-68 or F18. Just want to clarify this uh, because, you know, gallium-68 was... Uh, broadly uh, used uh, in research, um, uh, uh, you know, areas in the United States. It's already approved in Europe, but in the United States, people were using gallium-68 a lot, not because it is a better radio tracer, but because it is mostly generator produced radio tracer. That means you can buy your own generator and put it in your clinic and you, uh, you can start imaging the patients. But if 18 labeled PSMA, the, if, uh, the accuracy and everything is very, very, very similar to each other. But uh, the, you need Psychotron to get F18 if you want to do the research studies. Right now, it is FDA approved. We can get a unit dose. But that was the reason. Uh, that's why gallium-68 a little bit ahead for uh, um, the research studies. You, you see lots of um, articles, you know, uh, research about the gallium-68 uh, compared to P, uh, PYL imaging, but that was kind of more easy to, uh, to, to produce the radio tracer. That was the main reason. It is newly uh, approved. This is important because it is also improved at the initial staging diagnosis, which is different than other uh, radio tracer we have discussed so far. It is also approved for biochemical recurrence as well. So when you, we go back to NCCN guidelines, the new changes, that's why they were able to put this here because it was also approved for the initial baseline staging. Uh, gallium 68 PSMA 11 is first radio PSMA 11 PSMA imaging agent approved in the United States in uh, late 2020. It was little kind of weird the approval process because uh, it was approved um, and then it's a currently only available right now. It's only available in Tucson in California, but it was approved for UCSF and UCLA. I know people working there; they spent 
millions of hours uh, to get this approved. But, you know, that statement FDA saying that it is approved for do, uh, those two um, uh, big institutions, but other institutions, they have the manufacturing capabilities, could produce their own tracers. That time I was kind of um, exploring if we can get it, you know, here, if you buy our own uh, generator. And I've been told, uh, although we have uh, our own generator, the process, all that paperwork may take maybe two years to get the uh, um, the uh, approval from the, you know, the uh, NRC or other uh, other regulatory agent to use it here. So it was it was a little weird approval, but you know that it was a kind of um, telling us the other PSMA imaging uh, is coming onto, onto the market. It is generally, uh, as I said, um, mostly generator produced. It can be produced by Psychotron too, but it is, uh, it is very easy to do it through the generator. That's why we have lots of data about gallium-68 PSMA. Um, it, it, the good thing about gallium-68 PSMA, there was a lot of comparison with MRI too, because MRI at the beginning when uh, it was first introduced as, uh, for prostate cancer imaging, there were a lot of also kind of inaccuracy uh, in the reading, especially between the readers, because, you know, it was a learning curve. That gallium-68 PSMA, they, they uh, started using it and started to compare with MRI, and there was a really good Good correlation with gallium 68 uh, and MRI imaging and they said it is a complementary in primary cancer assessment especially uh, it is better performed in a larger tumor which is more than five millimeter uh, it is superior to standard imaging in preoperative lymph node staging uh, in intermediate to high-risk prostate cancer patients. There are a lot of research uh, outside, and the accuracy uh, was almost like 90%, and it is specific. Uh, it is sensitive, uh, but specificity, specificity is much higher than sensitivity. I have another slide I will uh, show you, but we have to be very careful about uh, the positivity, the location, not to, um, uh, you know, overcall uh, some other, uh, other uh, abnormalities, cancers or other benign abnormalities. They might have PSMA expression. It is uh, superior to conventional imaging in staging. You know, sensitivity and specificity is kind of higher than the CT imaging. And also it is superior uh, to uh, bone scan uh, or other type of bone imaging in preoperative staging. <clears throat> Uh, it is, this is one of the uh, uh, example, one of the study, they, they showed the improved sensitivity of PSMA PET compared to bone scan. This is a patient with uh, PSA uh, level was 500. So um, it, it, uh, it is a castration resistant prostate cancer. Patient was uh, anti anthrogenic therapy. Bone scan showed some disease, but it was limited. You know, it was involvement of lumbar, uh, lumbar spine, maybe some ribs, some femur involvement, maybe some positivity over here. But when you perform, look at this, it's the same patient with very, I think within, within a week they did the gallium 68 imaging. So it was significantly different, extensive osseous metastasis. So it is definitely superior than bone scan with almost 100% specificity. Uh, in terms of sodium fluoride imaging, so I was saying that it is better than bone scan. When you compare the bone uh, metastasis evaluation, uh, using PSMA versus sodium fluoride, it is kind of pretty similar to each other. It is, um, it, sodium fluoride is very sensitive, but also gallium-68 is pretty accurate to evaluate it. Uh, and also um, could be useful not for staging, but for response assessment. This is a kind of sensitive uh, topic yet, but there is no consensus. But for response assessment or treatment monitoring, the uh, in bone involvement, the PSMA can be used too. Uh, 
in biochemical recurrence it is again uh, correlate with the psa value if more psa value the scan accuracy sensitivity uh, that specificity will increase but compared to colon imaging if you remember that the numbers were like a less than one one to two three more some uh, but right now the the value of psma level is less in the uh, psma imaging so you can detect the lesion almost 60% uh, positive lesion almost 60 percent when uh, the PSA level is less than 0 0.5 in biochemical recurrence. In terms of lymph node metas metastasis, as you know, we have, um, you know, size limitation on conventional imaging. So if for the PSMA imaging, if you have a intense activity in the lymph node, no matter the size is, it is positive. It is very um, high accuracy uh, for uh, evaluating a small lymph node. This patient's um, uh, P, um, PSA level was, um, I, I think, 0 .0, uh, 0 0.9. So they detected it, they did the surgery, uh, the treatment, and after that, the, uh, the PSA value uh, was 0 0.07. So one thing about, uh, we also discuss in our clinical practice, if you have a focus of increased uptake in the bone, but if the CT scan, correlative CT scan is negative, still it, they say you sh probably should trust the PSMA imaging because um, you may not see uh, any change on the uh, CT scan in early cancer, but eventually you may see sclerosis. We do see this in breast cancer a lot. Sometimes we do see FDG activity in the bones, but there is no corresponding CT abnormality. Uh, however, in the follow-up imaging, we start seeing that uh, treatment-related kind of sclerosis the area. So we, uh, whenever we, we use uh, the F18 FTG for uh, breast cancer, doesn't matter the CT uh, correlate, we usually call it. So it is kind of similar to PSA imaging. <laughs> So in this one, actually, this is the early set of imaging. There was increased activity, nothing corresponding on the CT, but patient did the treatment. So on the six month follow up, the the, the um, you know sclerotic focus uh, appeared. So it uh, the PSMA was uh, actually accurate compared to the uh, CT uh, imaging. So performance of um. MRI and gallium-6 uh, PSMA PETAMAR was higher in high-risk versus intermediate-risk patients. I have another slide for that. We all know uh, the T-staging right now, the recommended modality is MR. Uh, the lymph node and bone is PSMA imaging. However, if you have a, a, a capability of doing MR and PSMA imaging on the PETAMAR, actually that must, that is probably the future uh, direction for the imaging, then you can have accurate T staging plus accurate N and M staging. So this is one of the study the Australian group uh, has published a lot. Um, uh, Dr. Hoffman, you know, is very famous in prostate field. So they were uh, evaluating the utility of gallium-68 in detection of metastasis disease and high risk in advanced uh, prostate cancer. So uh, the conclusion was uh, the low PSA level, uh, the biochemical recurrence, uh, when you use the gallium-68, uh, although it is low PSA level, it is uh, very accurate. And when you have a little bit more PSA level, accuracy will increase, sensitivity and specificity will increase. So it is similar to the other imaging agents, but when you start seeing them like almost less than 5, 0 0.5, almost 50% cases turn out to be positive. So it was their uh, prospective randomized multicenter trial pro PSMA study. I just wanted to show this uh, how they uh, randomized the people. They selected the people. Um, they were looking for diagnostic performance of PSMA PET versus conventional imaging. What they did, they looked at uh, you know high risk and intermediate risk, risk patients, and they put one one group of patients and randomly in CT plus bone. Uh, scan the other uh, patients they put it in um, you know PSMA imaging and uh, 
then they followed the patient uh, and they did serial imaging. Uh, young, uh, approximately 300 uh, patients were involved in the study. So what they found is uh, not the PSMA accuracy versus conventional imaging was 30% more. And uh, based on this imaging findings, almost 30% uh, uh, change in the treatment plan. So this is really uh, kind of interesting because this is a prospective randomized trial. So uh, th th this is something I think we are kind of going through uh, the same uh, path right now. Uh, it will it will change our management a lot too. And uh, one other thing, uh, the study noted that um, PSMA uh, imaging uh, was much likely to produce inconclusive results or equivocal results. It was uh, only 7% compared to the 23% by conventional imaging. Uh, they did lots of studies comparing PSMA imaging with fluoxetine. So this is head-to-head -head comparison, only 10%, uh, 10 patients involved. But one thing I want to show here is 50% patients were negative on fluoxetine oximin scan, but uh, the uh, you know it, they were positive on uh, PSMA scan. It, they suggested that superior detection rate on PSMA imaging than fluoxetine. Because it is 10 patients, you may not really feel comfortable uh, actually, this is one of the uh, image examples. So these two small nodules, they are pretty small here. Uh, it was, uh, they were negative on uh, fully cyclovin oximin scan, but they were positive on PSMA scan. They did another study. This is prospective head-to-head -head comparison, phase three trial. Uh, they compared fully cyclovin with gallium 68 PSMA imaging. 50 patients. They uh, did. Uh, they scanned the patient with both radio tracers within 15 days, and there was. If there is an uptake, they call it positive. There is no um, biopsy correlation. Uh, so obviously, uh, the detection rate were significantly lower with oxygen study compared to PSMA. It's almost like a doubled. And pelvic lymph nodes was much more detected by PSMA imaging, and extra pelvic lesions were detected by only PSMA imaging. And one other thing, actually, it's kind of really um, grabbed my eyes, was that reader agreement. Reader agreement for PSMA PET CT was significantly higher than for Oximin study. This is one of the things that really um, important for us. As I said, if Oximin study is straightforward, we are we are calling it. But if it is uh, like intermediate, we all have different opinions. Although all of us like have enough in experience how to read the Oximin studies. Um, this is also uh, another study uh, published. Um, actually, this is based on uh, the uh, SNMMI and EAN, uh, EANM uh, recommendation for prostate cancer. So it, the staging and during PSMA directed radio therapy, radio, radiotherapy. So B PSMA imaging is very very important. If it is low PSMA expression in target lesion, you can't do the treatment. In advanced stage, uh, mainly in the metastasis, uh, mainly in the liver, the uh, the, the um, cancer itself can uh, lose PSMA expression. This is also important uh, when we have more experience with PSMA imaging. If we start seeing a patients, you know, like a living low longer with better treatment, but eventually there might be sensitive, uh, uh, like um, uh, uh, PSMA imaging may lose the um, receptor sensitivity, kind of I'm thinking similar to our iodine imaging. At the beginning, iodine, the cancer might be so sensitive to iodine, but eventually uh, you, uh, they may use their uh, differentiation for iodine. So maybe if, uh, eventually we will start seeing this too. So let's talk about the, the other PSMA imaging, uh, the, um, the current one, PyDerify. It's the second generation. Whatever I talk uh, for gallium-68, actually it applies here too. Sensitivity, specificity, it is very, very close to gallium-68. Um, uh, they did comparison. 
um, head to head comparison. All suspicious lesions detected by gallium 68 was also detected by uh, F18. So that time it was no, 2015. They said it might be alternative to gallium 68. Actually, it is it is the same. It's not, you know, alternative, maybe a little bit. I don't know, a little bit better in terms of detection uh, rate. Uh, it is for pr for primary cancer detection using the PIDRFI F18 PYL imaging is kind of 50-50. Some studies say it is really good, but some studies say it is um, it is not. Uh, there is overlap with between BP BPH, but we. we uh, during our study here uh, with um, PYL imaging, uh, with our experience, if you have a kind of delayed imaging, you will see the lesion better. So I think it is kind of really um, comparable with MRI. This is my personal opinion. It is not really lower than multiparametric MRI. It's pretty, uh, pretty comparable um, and especially um, uh, Especially high-grade lesions, uh, I, I think it's it may may be usable uh, for future. So this is just an example, you know, the prostate cancer BPH. There was no uh, radio tracer activity, but the, the prostate cancer there was an increased radio tracer activity. Its sensitivity and specificity is very very similar to gallium 68 imaging. Um, it is definitely superior than conventional imaging. And actually, in this study, they found 50% disease in the uh, the cases um, in the lymph nodes less than three millimeter. So this is this is a big thing, you know. If you can identify three millimeter lymph nodes in the pelvic cavity when before your radiation treatment, so it may change your um, uh, may, may change your um, uh, the coverage. So it is very important. It is definitely superior to conventional imaging. This is again another example with small lymph nodes. You would never ever call this abnormal on CT, but on the uh, PSMA imaging, it is positive. So in, 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 in terms of bone metastasis, the sensitivity and specificity of uh, PYL is definitely higher than bone scan. So one thing I just want to emphasize, sometimes the the discrepancy may be coming from misinterpretation. This is one of our case. This was read as a normal scan. They said there is no uh, scintigraphic evidence of metastatic disease. This is patient's PSMA study done here. There's extensive metastasis. Actually, when you look at this study, you don't see the kidneys here. This is called a super scan. Actually, this means when you have a super scan, it means that this patient has full metastasis in the bones. So sometimes because of interpretation error, uh, you know, uh, we have to be careful about uh, the interpretation too. It is superior to conventional imaging and biochemical recurrence, and it is uh, superior to other imaging modalities like uh, uh, other other um, uh, radio tracers. Uh, when it has a low PSA level, it is very successful. Early detection, you know, when you have a local recurrence and lesion outside the prosthetic fossa, it, you have more detection when you have a higher PSA, similar to other uh, imaging uh, choices. And this is one of our case. The lymph node was really small, and there are actually several lymph nodes, one, two, three lymph nodes, but only one lymph node was uh, radio tracer avid. So that was one. Uh, that was the uh, metastatic one. So this is a very good study. Uh, they looked at the PYL uptake in the post-prostatectomy uh, patients. Uh, for, those are uh, considered for salvage radiation. Therapy. This one. Uh, this is a prospective trial just published uh, April 2021. So uh, the their conclusion uh, was actually the the uh, doing this uh, treatment. Um, the imaging has changed their um, uh, radio uh, radio um, uh, radiotherapy um, uh, inclusion. It changed it. So. Uh, these type of studies we should look more because uh, changing management is a big issue right now in uh, after PSMA imaging. Uh, one of the other studies showed that after PSMA imaging, <clears throat> they changed the plant management almost 21 percent. 
one issue false positivity and false negativity on psma imaging we in any type of imaging we always have false positivity false negativity in the psma specifically this is a nice um, you know like imaging pitfall uh, article uh, they looked at the po uh, false positive and false negative ones and they concluded that uh, false positivity in biochemical recurrence is less than, was less than 10%, and most of the time it was in the prostate bed, and it was mostly in the radiotherapy patient, you know, prior radiation treatment, uh, the pa uh, patient had prior radiation treatment. So there might be some inflammation uh, going on, and the PSA, PSMA uh, shows um, positivity, and false negativity was mostly due to small metastasis small size metastasis. This is a very nice article, review article about false positivity and false, uh, actual false positivity. When you look at this, lots of benign lesions, lots of malignant lesions showed PSMA positivity. One uh, hot topic right now is gliomas. Actually, there is um, a big research going on right now for a PSMA for on glioma detection and PSMA for glioma treatment. Um, but when you look at this, almost all type of cancers may have PSMA positivity. So what does this mean? That means if you have an unusual site of PSMA activity, or it, if it doesn't fit the, uh, the expected uh, imaging finding, we should be careful. For example, in this scan, this is uh, the one uh, one of the uh, case uh, from Dr. Hussein. You know, you see there is an increased uptake. This is definitely a positive scan. But when you look at the CT portion, this patient has an emphysema. Apparently, he's a smoker. And also, this lesion is a speculated lesion. It's going to the pleura. If you do look at the CT, this is a primary lung, ca lung cancer period. So, and primary lung cancer can express PSMA. This, uh, we call this metastasis. It was one of our early cases. Actually, this is 99.9% uh, .9 the lung cancer case. One other topic is ADT impact on PSMA uh, scan. So there are two different uh, opinions on that, uh, but the, accepted opinion from my understanding is um, the PSA, uh, the long-term ADT uh, significantly reduces the visibility of the castration resist uh, sensitive, castration sensitive uh, prostate cancer on PSMA PET CT. And we recommend, they say, we recommend referring patients for PSMA PET CT before starting ADT. This is a, a European uh, Journal of Nuclear Medicine study. And actually, uh, the consensus on the consensus statement on PSMA PET CT in Europe, they said potential flare on PSMA after ADT treatment can be seen. That's why if patient is on ADT treatment, you have to wait three months uh, to scan the patient at the initial uh, timing between the uh, ADT initialization and PSMA scanning. And uh, one study they did with 15 patients, they saw like a um, SUV max decrease in the hormone sensitive patients. And on the seven uh, patients were castration resistant and uh, they, uh, they said increase in the castration resistant prostate cancer. Uh, this is also uh, a, a new uh, study. Um, so because of that, I think the concern with ADT is very valid. Uh, and that's why they say the ADT uh, sh PSMA imaging either should be done before ADT initiation or uh, maybe three months. It's, this is not a consensus. This is just a recommendation. Maybe three months after um, after the ADT. Uh, one of um, you know, last week, uh, Dr. Bridwell was here. He's an advisor for uh, pilarify imaging, and he was also suggesting at least four to six weeks after ADT, and if it is pos possible, should be done prior to ADT. So is there anything for SUV max cutoff? Uh, we love to look at SUV, especially clinicians are asking us what is the SUV level, but the number is not really... Um, everything in PET imaging and similar to prostate cancer. This is one of the study they came uh, up with the 5.3. Um, I, I don't know, you know, that the, I'm a thoracic imager also. 
there was a study is when first FTG um, introduced for lung cancer, they were saying the 2.5 is the cutoff, but I have seen tons of uh, positive cancer less than 2.5 or no FTG avid cancer. So we have to be a little bit careful about the SUV and numbers. Uh, there, there needs to be, uh, we need more studies uh, to do that. In terms of response assessment, uh, this is very hot topic also. The, um, the, the On the consensus statement on PSMA PET in Europe, they were suggesting maybe we should say that responders versus non-responders. So non-responders will be the progressive disease. Responders will be the others. So there is, again, still no consensus. But the one thing they said, if you want to use PSMA for a response, you have to get the baseline PSMA just to compare it. Um, Petamar, as I said, is a uh, is a novel technology. Only few institutions have it. One is Northwestern. It is simultaneous acquisition. You will have really nice uh, MRI imaging plus uh, PSMA PET imaging. That might be the future best future combination. It is one of our case with high if uh, radio tracer activity in the you know the lesion here, but uh, you know this one. Uh, the bone lesion was missed, and this tiny bone lesion was missed on the MRI, but we detected on a uh, uh, PET portion, and actually it changed uh, the management a lot. So this is one of the study, very interesting. They showed five-year trends of bone scan and PSMA, and retrospectively in a private center. So this is the performance of the exam. They performed almost 3,000 studies and almost 2,500 was a PSMA and little bone scan. So this is uh, just for urologist pattern. They didn't look at uh, oncologist, <coughs> you know, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist pattern. But you see here, this is the PSMA, how there's a big slop here compared to bone scan. Uh, there was a kind of really, um, you know, less, uh, there was a less interest in bone scan. In the six months after PSMA PET, there was almost 50% decrease in the numbers of bone scan performed uh, in that institution. So, I don't want to go through that much oligometastatic disease, polymetastatic disease, but the concept is, like tumor board burden, if less tumor versus uh, like a widespread tumor. But the thing is, it is a big, uh, the big topic right now. So if you have a better detection of the uh, lesions, if you say oligometastatic versus polymetastatic or via versa, there is a big change in treatment. So PSMA imaging, actually, we have to be ready for this, this change because of the sensitivity and specificity of PSMA imaging. They say if the scan is negative, it is very valuable in low uh, risk patients, especially if uh, you are going to perform the, uh, the uh, like a, um, uh, radiation treatment in a patient. So if it is negative, you can trust the scan. Um, one other uh, thing that uh, they want to make sure this, uh, the sensitivity. The sensitivity is affected by the lesion size. If it is small lesion, obviously, that you may not see the, um, the radiotracer activity well. Uh, but uh, in terms of lymph node detection, uh, the PSMA imaging much more sensitive than CT or MRI. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, skip this one. So current issues, I have few slides left. Current issues is the one of them is the cost. And we know PET CT or PET imaging is currently more expensive than the CT plus bone, bone scan. This is just to give you some idea about the cost. Uh, again, these are just the radio tracer costs. I'm not talking about the scanner cost or like a technical fee, other things. But PSMA is four to six hundred. The oximin is about five thousand, and FTG is nine, almost hundred uh, bucks. But bone scan is less than fifty bucks. So, uh, you know. Uh, we have to really uh, work on this too. And reimbursement-wise, uh, private insurances were kind of really good. 
Medicare was a little bit resistant to uh, pay for baseline assessment. Uh, as you know, the PSMA uh, is still, uh, PYL is still not the pass-through coverage. We are expecting it in January 2020, which will help us to get some, at least some revenue from it. So, uh, one thing about the PSMA, there is a, a lot of radiotracer activity within the bladder. It affects the evaluation of the salivary, uh, so, uh, sorry, um, uh, the, the glands uh, related to the process, I forgot now. Um, uh, then, uh, but there is a radio tracer PSMA uh, 1007, actually it's, it has a hepatobiliary excretion and uh, it will not go to uh, urinary bladder a lot. That's a good thing. And one other thing, PSMA detected metastasis may lead to decision not to treat the primary tumor if you, we have a lot of uh, positivity. Um, maybe uh, it may cause unnecessary additional investigation and delay in the treatment, maybe rib biopsies, we will perform more. And uh, in terms of the participation of the clinical trial, we have to be really careful about it. And in economic scale, as I showed you, it's a little bit expensive. So we have to be cautious before ordering the scan. We are all excited, and but sometimes if there is no added value to the management, maybe we should not uh, order this study. And uh, you and w the one thing that three months was the recommended uh, interval from the European site for ADT. And a uh, specific clinical scenario, we have to be careful about the oligometastatic versus polymetastatic disease. And sometimes PSMA PET comes with the incomplete information um, because of the lack of histology genomic data. Um, we have to be really careful about it. And I think the first conclusion we can make is that increasing use of advanced PET imaging has led to the increased detection, but we have to be careful. We did this type of, you know, dilemma when first breast cancer screening came to the, uh, you know, the clinical use, lung cancer screening, you know, when we start doing lung cancer screening, we start seeing all that tiny nodules. We are not sure what to do with them. Maybe at the beginning, we will have some hesitation in the PSMA imaging. That's why I just made it up. It's not from anywhere. That's why maybe we should propose something how to use the PSMA tracer in daily practice. Maybe it's a kind of, we can say this is Northwestern experience, North, Northwestern recommendation based on the PSMA positivity and location, the number of the abnormality, because PSMA treatment is coming. So we have to be really full prepared for it. And few last words, just this is my last slide. Um, Molecular imaging really a very promising technology, especially in the prostate cancer world. And PET imaging is really complementary in the primary T staging to evaluate the gland, but it is way better than conventional imaging for initial staging and biochemical recurrence. And I think uh, the PSMA targeted agents are the changing the game right now, and they are superior to the, our previous uh, competitors, C11 and Oximin study. And again, a novel treatment is about to start, uh, PSMA receptor positivity, lutetium PSMA. We were uh, a participant for vision trial, and uh, I hope we are going to start uh, the like a uh, um, compassion, uh, compassionate use of the um, lutetium treatment too. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I think I exceeded the time a few minutes. Sorry about that. That's okay. That was a great talk. Um, does anyone have any quick questions? Um, Hatije. Hi, Hatije. Great job. This is Tim, the nuclear pharmacist. And hey, I, just want, I did want to point out one thing, and, and you had mentioned, and, and unfortunately, we are in the business of uh, healthcare in the, in the scope of. Um, you know, trying to optimize uh, uh, margins and generate revenue. And, and unfortunately, right now, with PSMA not being, or uh, Plurify specifically, not having pass-through status, we did run an initial report. It is limited data because we only did a, t a very short time frame. So we had 50 studies that were, that were evaluated in terms of the revenue captured. And um, 
based on, on the revenue compared to just the product cost, we are negative uh, over $60,000 for those 50 studies. Now, 54% of them happen to be Medicare, which Medicare is only reimbursing for the, the pet portion, not the, the drug itself. So just to put a little perspective, obviously J after January 1st, when it gets passed through status, that will significantly change. Um, but for the time being, uh, that is, that's the state we're in. So just wanted to, to give that information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Tim is our uh, manager in nuclear medicine. He's uh, the pharmacist and uh, actually uh, he uh, was the one of the main person to uh, brought uh, to bring the PSMA imaging to Northwestern. Thank you. Um, Dr. Catalano, actually, I think he has a question. Yes. Um, so I, I have a patient who has, you know, high PSA and locally advanced disease and he had a uh, PSMA PET and there was nothing in the prostate, there was nothing in the lymph nodes, and he had a tiny lesion in the rib. So how, how likely is it in that setting that that and it was an avid lesion, PSMA avid lesion, how likely is it that that's metastatic? Uh, thank you so much. It's a great question. Actually, uh, we were just talking about this with Dr. Ross a few um, few days ago uh, about our kind of research, one of the research topics. So actually, we should learn a lot from the PSMA imaging. So it is really less likelihood of having one rib lesion. Uh, positive rib lesion and uh, and nothing else, uh, especially nothing else in the pelvis. Uh, we do see those cases. We actually we did see those cases in oximin studies too. So if it is positive, we sh I think if it is the only lesion, first we have to think about the false positivity maybe. But uh, I know from the clinical practice, depending on the PSA level, maybe you guys will end up to do a biopsy if it is amenable for biopsy. So, but probably from my perspective, the best thing to do uh, a follow-up imaging. I uh, because we know some of the cancers are not PSMA um, avid, but uh, just only one rib lesion uh, likelihood of being uh, prostate-related metastasis is pretty low if there is nothing else. Uh, Dr. Hussein is gonna say, and Dr. Hart. So I think you guys just jump on the discussion. Sure, maybe I can go. So I think, um, Hatice, you've done a fantastic job. I think there's a lot for us to learn. And I do think that the critical part in, uh, from my perspective is to be um, more cautious about the overall picture rather than just a believer, because you and I have shared several cases when a PSMA in a rib abnormality changed after time. Uh, another patient we biopsy turned out to be, have multiple myeloma. Uh, the other gentleman that you just saw with the, with the lung cancer, I do think that's going to be the critical part. But the other part, I think, clinically, is the issue of covering the cost. Because my uh, understanding is that Medicare or insurance right now is only covering uh, the PSMA based on the FDA approval for detection, but not for sequential follow-up on therapy. Is that the case? Yes, that's my yeah. understanding. Too. And so that's going to be a hard thing where, because exactly I have a case right now where re conventional imaging is completely normal. The PSMA is the only uh, imaging that's showing multiple areas of abnormality. I might have reached out to you uh, about him. And the issue comes up, if I'm going to treat him, how am I going to monitor response? You know, yeah, we can check PSA and all of that. But how am I going to assess the disease? That's the hard part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my 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 question ha had to do with uh, the the local detection. You were talking about the difficulty of seeing the seminal vesicles, and I I assume the base of the prostate too because of the bladder uptake. Would it would it make sense in those patients where we're considering or where, where we're concerned about that to catheterize them uh, so that you get as empty a bladder as possible? Yeah. The thing is, because this is a radio tracer, it's a radioactive, you know, um, uh, it is not really widely used to catheterization of the patient. Uh, the, that same thing was used uh, 
thought for a uh, cervical cancer patients, you know, that it is also blocking. And um, some institutions were using it and it became an issue for contamination and other things. Uh, what we did for our uh, clinical trial he uh, here, uh, you know, we recommend the patient to, you know, go to the bathroom before the scan. However, because it is a con and it takes too much time to scan the patient. Um, and also these patients, special for initial assessment, if a patient has a big prostate, some, uh, you know, like a blockage over there. It is, it is uh, sometimes difficult. You have to really window, uh, but ca catheterization, uh, although it seems reasonable, I don't, I think in daily practice, it's not going to work. It's going to um, add a, too much additional thing and it will increase the contamination and on the scanner. And uh, I don't think it's a really a feasible thing. The best thing to 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 have a radio tracer and not go through the uh, renal collecting system, go through the uh, the liver, and they will not go to bladder. So um, that is the best radio tracer. They are working on it. Uh, there is some improvement. Um, yeah, that's that's I think that my answer. Um, Doctor uh, Kotel and Doctor Hussein, uh, I think you could just 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 jump. No, I'm done. I, uh, I sure. already you answered my questions. Thank sure, you. Sure, sure. And Dr. Catalano, you are. He just likes keeping his hand up. No, okay. I think I, think I just good. learned that we have to lower our hand, so we just lowered it. Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Dr. Savas. It was again a great discussion, um, and uh, everyone, thank you for staying late. Have a great night. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.